tonight as the choir leads us. Tonight, looking forward to that. Hope to see you here at 530. If you would, open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And if you would, please stand in honor of God's word. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be a great, he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the whole, Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Gracious Father, help us today to grow, to deepen our understanding of who you are, that our love for you might become stronger because we listen to the proclamation of your word, we take it to our hearts, and we live according to to your word, just as Mary did. Help us to follow in their example. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. A lot of times we, uh, ironically, don't hear a lot about the story of Mary and Joseph, and uh, not so much where it's just focused on them. And I think there's a good reason for that, because the story is really ultimately not about Mary and Joseph. But really, that's true for every story in the Bible. So why is it that when we come to Mary and Joseph, we really have a hard time just kind of focusing on the events around their lives? And I think it's because they're so close to the star of the show, right? I mean, Jesus is the star of the show. And so when we read about Mary and Joseph, it's always in line of Jesus. What I'd like to argue this morning is we should do that about every character in the Bible that we should read it through the lens of how they play into the story of Jesus, the story of God. But today I believe we have a lot to learn about uh, life, about uh, growing in our walk with the Lord by looking at the story of Mary and Joseph. And so I want you to be encouraged by Mary and Joseph by learning four lessons from their story. So we're going to go over a few chapters today in the story of Mary and Joseph, and each one of those chapters is going to have a lesson that goes with it that we can kind of take away from that and run with. Chapter number one, the poor, royal, and noble family of Jesus. The poor, royal, and noble family of Jesus. I want you to notice how this begins in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, this is Gabriel, okay? He's pretty famous. Back in those days, they didn't have a whole lot of celebrities, but angels were some of them, okay? And uh, he was pretty famous. And so now we have this story starting where the angel Gabriel, who'd been a religious celebrity in that day to some degree, comes to a young Jewish peasant girl named Mary in a city called Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is the setting of this Christmas story, and it could not be any more 
humbling. It's a small village, had about 500 people in the region of Galilee. No significance whatsoever, not mentioned at all in the Old Testament. And the few times it's mentioned in the New Testament, it's, you're from Nazareth, okay? <laughs> you ever met somebody, oh, you're from that place. And, uh, you know, I, I went to watch the Henderson Lions this past week play the Carthage Bulldogs, and my apologies if you're from Carthage, but, uh, uh, you know, growing up, you're, you're from Carthage, really, okay. Um, that, that was just, it was in our blood, okay, and that, that not the Christian thing to think, but, uh, but it just was the way it was when I grew up. So, but we've matured since then, right? Uh, so, so, uh, so anyway, from Nazareth, okay, and nothing good comes from Nazareth. This is a very humbling setting for this story to begin. And one of the things you should know is that Mary and Joseph were poor. They were the parents of Jesus, and the family that Jesus was born into was a very poor family. Joseph was a carpenter. You learn that in Matthew 13, 55. Not a profitable trade anyway, but especially in a small village such as Nazareth. And that's why later on when they went to the temple to sacrifice, they didn't take the normal lamb that... Uh, wealthier people would have been able to sacrifice or even middle class people would have been able to sacrifice. They had to uh, bring doves with them to sacrifice at the temple because they were poor. And even so, this was a royal family in a sense because they were of the line and lineage of David. Uh, if you look over in Matthew chapter 1, uh, he begins with what would have been to them very fascinating what for us quite often is, if we're going through those daily Bible reading plans, we just cringe when we read the words. Here's the book of the genealogy of, we just, oh, today's going to be a rough day Bible reading wise, right? Uh, but for them, it was fascinating. It was fascinating because the reason he put all of that there was to prove a few different things. First, that he was of pure Jewish blood. But secondly, and most importantly, he was of the line of Abraham. The family of Abraham, and then of the line of David. He was a descendant of David. And in fact, Joseph is the only other person in the Bible called the son of David, in the New Testament at least, the son of David, other than Jesus. Okay, so all of this to prove who Jesus is. And another thing we should know about the family of Jesus is not only were they poor and royal, normally those two don't go together, but they were also noble. And what I mean by that is that they had integrity. Okay, Mary, uh, if we were to turn over, uh, and we'll get there in just a little bit, to uh, just before Luke chapter 2, uh, we find her hymn to the Lord called the Magnificat. And in that, we see someone who loves the Lord, but not only loves the Lord and can sing a song, but someone who understands the story of Israel. If we were to look at Joseph, which we're going to look at him in isolation here in just a moment, he was, it says in Matthew chapter 1, a righteous or just man. So Jesus was born into a family that was poor. They were of the line of David, so they had royal blood in them. And they were a noble family in the sense that they had integrity, they had, in char they had character, and they loved the Lord. Now here's what I want to, here's the lesson I want to take away from all of this. God often works wonders through wonderless circumstances, so keep walking. God often works wonders through wonderless circumstances, so keep walking. The God and creator of the universe is about to enter into human history and the circumstances surrounding it, granted there, there was a star, there's an angel, there's a virgin birth, so there's some pretty cool wonders and things going on. But if we're on the ground level and we're walking through the day as Mary and Joseph were on a daily basis, those things lasted a very short amount of time. Every day they woke up and they looked around, they were still poor, they were still living in Nazareth. And they didn't see angels popping in all the time. Here's an appearance. He comes, he speaks to Mary. He goes, he speaks to Joseph. But then their day-to-day -day activity is mundane, run-of-the-mill, plain. And yet, they are supposed to keep going, knowing that God somehow is working wonders, even in these wonderless circumstances. For us, Christmas is 
the most wonderful time of the year for many of us. It's full of wonder. We've got lights. We've got decorations. We've got it, it's it's uh, Hallmark movie time, right? Uh, some of you've been roped into that, haven't you? Okay, so so there's Hallmark movie time. There's all of these things that just kind of make this the most wonderful time of the year. For them, it was nothing like that. We're going to get more into that part of it later. One of my favorite hymns, I was asked this week what my favorite hymn is. And I, I think it's this one, written by Charles Wesley, called And Can It Be? And I want to read a quote from it. It says, He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. It's his mercy all immense and free. For, oh my God, it found out me. He emptied himself. Jesus, the wonder of everything, emptied himself of that glory. And he goes and he hangs out with us to show us his way, his truth, and his life. And Mary and Joseph had a beautiful, glorious role in that. But their day-to-day -day activity was fairly mundane. Now, what we take away from this is when you look around at your life, sometimes doing the right thing means you got some laundry to do, you got some dishes to do, you got some servant-type things that you're doing that don't appear glorious, don't appear wonderful at all, and some of you would say, and in fact, they're not, okay? And that just may be true. But the reality is, every day we wake up, we need to be faithful to the Lord, even when things don't seem wonderful around us, trusting God that he is, in fact, working in those circumstances. Chapter number two. Chapter number two, the promise and astounding faithfulness of God. Look at verse 31, what the angel said. He said, and behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Israel forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is a promise coming to fulfillment thousands of years in the making. For thousands of years, God's people looked forward for God to send somebody to get them out of the mess that they got themselves in. They had not been faithful to God and in consequence of that, they found themselves exiled. So just kind of like Adam and Eve, they sinned against God. They're exiled out of Eden and Israel. They sin against God. They commit idolatry and they're exiled out of the promised land. And this is where they find themselves. And forever they're looking for a champion. They're looking for a king who's going to come and make everything right. And in fact, they had good reason to hope for that because God promised that to them. And you know what the biggest threat to that promise was? Us. Okay? God's people. Because at every turn, they want to turn back and do things their own way rather than trusting in God. And so time after time after time again, that covenant is threatened. That promise seems to be threatened. And yet even in our faithlessness, God is faithful. He's always there. He's always there with the invitation to come back. Come, let us return to the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they shall be white as snow. God invites them back even when they're in those consequences. And you know, time after time after time again, it had to appear to them like God was not going to deliver on his promise. Now, in the time of Jesus, the anticipation was rich. It was intense. If you don't think it was intense, if you don't think people believed that the Messiah was about to come, just go look at the story of Herod. He'd wipe out a whole city to make sure that the Messiah was not going to come. Why? Because he believed the prophecies along with them. They believed it. They were looking for the Messiah. John the Baptist, are you him? A little bit later, Simon Barco, are, are you the one? They were looking for the Messiah. And here the angel Gabriel comes and announces the royal announcement of the Messiah's birth to Mary. Basically saying this promise is happening now. You will give birth 
to the Son of God, and he will reign as king, and his kingdom is everlasting. It's happening now. That's why Jesus went around saying the kingdom is at hand. Here's a lesson we learned from this. God is working redemption perfectly even if we don't see it. So believe. God's working redemption perfectly even when we don't see it. So believe. It's amazing how much God is doing that we are totally ignorant of. I love the statement from John Piper. He says, you know, at any given moment, God's doing 10,000 things in your life, and you might be aware of three of them. God is always working. He works all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, Born under the law to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. At the perfect time, God sent his son. Not necessarily when God's people wanted it, not when they demanded it, not when they felt like God should send his son. But God sent his son. He sent the Messiah at the perfect time. Jim Dennison lists several reasons why Jesus appearing was at the perfect time. At that time, there was a universal cry for a Messiah. There was a universal language for the gospel, what they call the lingua franc, the Greek language. It was universal back in that day, and that's why you can go to many places, Honduras, Italy, Turkey, and you're going to bump into somebody who speaks English today. Back in that day, it was Greek, Koine Greek. There was universal peace for the church. Now, that might not seem overly apparent to us, but early on in the first budding centuries when the church was being planted, there was protection by the Roman Empire, believe it or not. There was sporadic persecution for sure. Many people lost their lives in the early years, but they could scatter, they could preach the gospel, and it could thrive in that day. And guess what? That was around the time they came up with a little thing called Rhodes. Okay, And so they could travel. Of course, I think they had them before then. But this was more of a universal road system back then. So people could travel from point A to point B, carry this message, and it could flourish in that time. And there was a hunger for truth. So when all the philosophers were kind of in their heyday back then, that's why Paul argued with those philosophers. People were hungering for truth, and it was at just that time. At the perfect time that God sent his son. He was bringing all of these things into play that we couldn't put that together for perhaps hundreds of, until hundreds of years later that all of these things were merging at the same time and yet God was working. So even when in the world around us and in our own individual lives, it seems like it appears to be going nowhere we can rest assured that God is working his plan and everything to the counsel of his will. Chapter number three, one of my favorites, a ruined reputation and a right identity. Turn over to Matthew chapter one, if you would. Matthew chapter one. And here we see a little bit about the man named Joseph. One of my favorite characters. In the Bible. It says that in verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And Matthew doesn't waste any time. He just goes directly into confronting the issue that would have been hovering over this. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, that is a Sadiq, a righteous man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not till she had given birth to a son. And he 
called his name Jesus. I want you to notice what Joseph was. Joseph was a, in the Greek, sadiq, a righteous man. This was his reputation in the small town of Nazareth. If any of you have ever lived, Temple's not a small town, okay? I've lived in small towns, smaller than Nazareth, okay? And let me just tell you something. Everybody knows everybody in small towns, okay? You're not getting away with nothing in a small town, okay? And uh, it, it's just the way it is. Everybody knows everybody. You walk into a grocery store and you're just going to get some milk and by the time you come out, you've got a family reunion, okay? I mean, it's just everywhere you go, you know folks. So Joseph was living in a small town and his reputation was that of a righteous, just man. That's who he was. What this means was that he uh, was labeled as this righteous person because he's one who studied, learned, and observed the law. He would have recited the Shema daily. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He followed dietary laws. He attended services at the synagogue. He participated in holy days and festivals. Like In order for him to be known as a righteous man, as a just man in that day, it would have looked a lot like this, that he is someone who is devout, he is religious, and he's doing all of this out of his love for God. He's seeking God and his righteousness. That's who Joseph was, and that's what Joseph was known for. And now Joseph gets word that Mary is pregnant. He gets word that Mary is pregnant, and he has a few options that he can consider regarding the law. For example, if this is adultery, he could st have her stoned to death. He could have her drink the water of bitterness to see if she would live. He has a number of different options. He chooses to divorce her quietly. Understand something. Joseph's reputation as a righteous man is over if he stays with Mary. It's over if he stays with Mary. Because everyone would believe he either had a part in it or he would at least be... Um, going along with adopting an illegitimate child in that day, those things did not work out to your benefit in the reputation category. But here's the lesson we learned from chapter 3. What others think of us, reputation, is not as important as who we really are, our identity, so be faithful to God. Understand, those two things are radically different. Was Joseph a righteous man when he decided to stay with Mary? Absolutely. In fact, his identity conformed more to that of God. He, uh, in that way, grew in his godliness. His identity grew even stronger, even as his reputation in that day would have most definitely suffered. And we'll get to some of that a little bit later. I like what Scott McKnight writes. He says, sometimes listening to the voice of God is that we ruin our reputation in the public square. Loving God involves surrendering ourselves to God in heart, soul, mind, strength, and reputation. The minute we turn exclusively to the Lord, we find our true identity dies on that day. We learned, as Thomas Kempis puts it, that when you surrender your reputation... <laughs> You won't care a fig for the waggling of 10,000 tongues. And this is the example that we find in Joseph and in Mary. In many ways, Jesus himself had a bad reputation, didn't he? Remember what people said about Jesus? He's a glutton. He's a drunk. And he's hanging out with folks he shouldn't be hanging out with. Last week, you kind of... Well, we all kind of chuckled when I said, okay, get your four by four out. If you don't, you don't know four lost people, you don't know four unchurched people, go to a bar. Okay? Now think about that. Maybe being faithful to the Lord means you're going to hang out with some people that otherwise you wouldn't hang out with, but you're hanging out with them because you want to bring them to Christ. And maybe in the consequence, you're guilty by association in the minds of some people. But if you're winning people to Christ, who cares about the wagon of ten thousand tons. This was Joseph. He knew the right thing to do, and so it says in Matthew chapter 1, he did it anyway. Now this brings us to chapter 4. A revolutionary peasant with a glorious vocation. Here we come to the story of Mary. 
We're tempted, you know, when people bow up around us to kind of shrink back, to be quiet, to become passive, and try to get out of the line of fire. Certainly that would have been Mary's situation in her day. It would have been a scandalous situation in her day. And yet what we see from Mary, if we were to keep reading in Luke chapter 1, is in fact just the opposite. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 51, that God has shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Those are revolutionary words because she's effectively looking at Herod. She's looking at the rulers, the corrupt rulers of her day. And she's saying, your days are numbered because my God tears down the corrupt and he raises up the righteous. That's what my my God does is what he's doing right now, and she's nothing in that day on the totem pole of who's who, and yet she has the audacity to say such words. Her words are revolutionary, but her vocation is glorious. Now, we look at Mary, and we see that she was given this role to mother the Son of God, and we say, oh, that is just absolutely glorious. It was only glorious after his resurrection, at least in the eyes of those around him. We read this, everything we read, we read through the lens of the empty tomb. But can you imagine on that side of it, when that story is still to unfold, and she's watching Jesus being crucified, she's watching throughout his life that he's living in a place where he doesn't have a place to lay his head at night, She's seeing all of these things, and her story was anything but glorious, but she was given a special assignment from God to raise Jesus and his brothers, okay, and he had sisters too, to raise Jesus and his siblings, to teach them the word, the scriptures, and she had this special assignment from God. Lesson number four, each believer should desire God's kingdom above all else and undertake their life's expression of that desire. So seek first his kingdom. I like what James Smith writes. He says, the primary goal of Christian education is the formation of a peculiar people. Listen to this. A people who desire the kingdom of God and thus undertake their life's expression of that desire. Mary desired the kingdom of God. This was the desire of her heart and her expression, undertaking her desire, the expression of her desire, looked like raising up the Son of God, being his mother. And most scholars believe Joseph was off the scene early. He passed away or something. So most of that time, she's probably doing this on her own. And this is her assignment from God. On the day-to-day ground level that looked anything but glorious understanding your vocation one day if you're faithful to your vocation i can promise you this it will look glorious it will look beautiful you will rejoice in it but can i say something to you probably not now many of the things that god's calls us calls us to do do not look glorious now they do later God exalts the humble. He opposes and tears down the proud. So some things that God is calling you to do, maybe go to the mission field and love on those in poverty, sharing the name of Jesus with them. It's not going to look glorious then. One day in heaven it will, and you'll rejoice in it. But we should undertake that expression of the deepest desire of our hearts. And in fact, I think that we do. Our vocation is that special assignment given to us by God, and it is reflected in your daily habits, your weekly goals, your yearly resolutions. It's how you shape your life. You shape your life around your passions. Lots of passion. I mentioned I went to a, a football game this past week. Lots of passion about that determines the clothes we wear our finances our possessions how you spend your time sacrifice folks it was cold this past friday night some sacrifice some travel uh, even affect your health perhaps uh, just to enjoy a game now what i'm arguing obviously I, I went to one so i'm not saying don't go okay but here here's what i am saying your primary passion will be the primary thing that shapes your life 
Mary found favor with God. Her expression of her love for God and his kingdom was demonstrated in the way that she lived her life on a day-to-day -day basis. And the same is going to be true for you, whatever that is. I want to close with four questions. It won't be on the screen. I just want you to listen to these questions. When circumstances in your life are wonderless, do you keep walking in faithfulness to God? Or do you expect God to wow you with a sign so you'll keep walking? So the Pharisees wanted Jesus. You want us to follow you as, as a Messiah? Give us a sign. We'll follow you. Always wanting a sign. Always wanting God to work some wonder to keep you in the game. Listen, folks. God can do this without us if he wanted to. He could. He could do it without me. He could do it without any single one. Jesus is the head. He keeps functioning with or without me or you. The question is, will you remain faithful to God even in wonderless circumstances? Question number two. When it feels like God is distant and not working, do you still believe or do you fall into skepticism? You ever fall into that, that, that skeptical, begrudging mindset? Well, I'm just not going to do this. It doesn't matter to anybody. It doesn't matter whether I do this or not. And we start talking to ourselves, start preaching to ourselves things that run contrary to the <laughs> word of God. That God has called us to do something not for you to become king. Not for you to be adorned with prestige, but so that he is glorified. This is why it calls us to do things, because he is worthy. And do you keep working, keep believing, even when God feels distant? I assure you he's not. Number three, which would you say is most important to you? What others think of you or who you really are? That is your reputation, or your identity. Which do you value most? Do you do things, in other words, just because you know what other people are going to say about you? I think each and every one of us perhaps are tempted with that from time to time where we do stuff just because we want the favor of other people. Let me tell you something. Mary had favor with God. Noah found favor in the eyes of of the Lord. He had not a lot of favor from anybody else. I mean, think about preaching the gospel your whole life and your converts are your family. And if you're kind of wondering, it's like, okay, Dad, you know, we're, we'll keep going. Keep building this ark. Nobody jumped on board with no except his family and he remained faithful to the Lord. It wasn't about his reputation. It was about his identity. And let, let me tell you something. Whatever God calls you to, whatever vocation you're not, for example, Mary was not a perfect parent. Okay? She, she wasn't perfect. Think about it. She lost Jesus. Can you just think about that for a moment? Okay? I, I haven't, don't think I've done that yet. Okay? I've got one in particular that, I mean, I lose him at least once a day, but we always find him that day. Okay? <laughs> always find him that day. In fact, just before the service started. Where is such and so? Won't mention any names, all right? <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but I've never lost him for more than a day, right? She, like days. Like you're traveling for days. and anybody seen Jesus? Really? Not a perfect parent. But you know what? She loved the Lord. And it wasn't about her reputation as much as it was about her identity before God. That she was going to love God. And pass on that story to her kids. Last question, number four. Big one. Perhaps most important. What desire, passion, or love is your life an expression of? What passion, what desire, what love is your life an expression of? In other words, what is your desire that shapes mainly, that is mainly responsible for shaping your life? Your day-to-day -day activities, what you do when you wake up in the morning, what you do in the middle of, between bed and bed, what you do in the middle of the day, and then what you do before you lay down at night. What is the deepest passion of your heart? What is it that you want most in life? And I want to invite you today to want 
Jesus, to hunger for Jesus more than anything else, to wake up in the morning worshiping him, delighting in him, loving him, rejoicing in who he is, rejoicing in his story, rejoicing in his kingdom, desiring his kingdom above all else. As Jesus said, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Just seek him first. I want to invite you to do that this morning. Now, maybe somebody out there on your journey, your spiritual journey, you've never even trusted in Jesus. You don't know God. And that is definitely the starting point, to repent of your sins and to trust in Jesus. Begin to worship Jesus and love Jesus and follow after Jesus. If you've never done that today, I want to invite you to trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've done that you haven't followed through with baptism. I want to ask you this morning, would you take that step on your spiritual journey? Maybe you're not a member of the church. I want to invite you to take that step. Maybe you, you're, you're here, you've been going here for years, but you haven't served on a ministry team. I want to invite you to take that step in your spiritual journey. Maybe you just come to worship, but you don't come to our 915 life groups or Sunday school. I want to invite you to do that. Get around people. Hover around the Bible, hover around the Word, and hear it taught, and hear different people's experiences as it relates to the passage, and grow in that fellowship, in that community. Or maybe you're here today, and you've never once in your life led someone to Jesus Christ. I pray today you'd make a commitment to take that step. Wherever you are on that journey I've just outlined, all I'm asking you this morning is to take that next step. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Gracious Father, Lord, I pray today that we would be a people of faith. We know that the day we trust in Jesus Christ is not like we just trust and now we're done. Now we're done with the faith part. We're going to heaven. We just move on. No. Father, this is an ongoing trust, an ongoing repentance, an ongoing faith and growth and, and development and confirmation to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And that is exemplified in our actions those desires in our hearts shape our actions our steps and so lord i pray that you would guide our steps this morning that if we truly love you that wherever we are on that spiritual journey whether it be trusting in jesus baptism becoming a member of the church going to a life group uh, serving on a ministry team or leading someone to Christ. Father, I pray that we would be faithful to do that. You've called us to be fishers of men, to multiply, to lead others to you. I pray that we do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand the altar.